So I'd like to welcome Joseph Kiefer tonight to our Zoom talk. And the title of his show, which is showing at the gallery right now, is I Still Believe in Beauty. And Joe, could you say a few words about the title of this show and what it means to you? Very happy to. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, I got a, uh, an email when the, when the uh, catalog came out on, on the, the internet and someone wrote back, uh, great title. And I wrote back, well, someone had to make a stand. So why am I say making this stand? It is only to say that uh, in the last hundred and something years, uh, the word beauty seems to have gone out of the discourse as the art world rushed toward novelty and, and the new. <clears throat> and for me, uh, beauty has always been the the, the higher priority and novelty is fine, but beauty is a bigger thing. What is beauty? Beauty, I suppose, is a, let's say beauty in a painting. Beauty in a painting to me is a painting which conjures a, a power bigger than me. Uh, maybe you could call that spiritual. Maybe you could call it godlike. <clears throat> but beauty is, uh, I think we all know it when we see it. And I'm not saying there's any one kind of beauty or any one place to find it. Uh, for me, it's often in nature, but it doesn't mean that that's the only place you could find it. And uh, I found the, the rising moon uh, a powerful evocation of a, of a higher something. So that's why that became the uh, title of the uh, show and the title picture in this, in this uh, Zoom and catalog. Uh, let's go over to the next one. This painting uh, is called Clearing Off for obvious reasons and it was done up in Winter Harbor. And I was, it was sort of camped out there for a couple of days and uh, I was basically do, there to do rocks but uh, I saw this thing and I kept seeing this group of trees and there was something about them. And then um, one day it fogged over considerably <clears throat> and I waited around and there's all the things you can do uh, even when it's foggy and, and, and fog is not your subject. But um, I, so I was messing with the rocks whose colors change by the way with every little flicker of different light. Anyway, um, you do one thing and you end up with something quite different. And I, I've made a sketch, and again, a small sketch. It must have been 12 by eight inches. And uh, when the sun broke through, it was intense, it was exciting. There was a, there was a sense of the fog blowing these, the fog away. And then suddenly when <clears throat> it disappeared and, and you could see pink clouds, it was all very dramatic. And at the bottom, of the uh, uh, the horizon level, that's where the fog was, and that's what was moving moving away. And what was up at the top were the clouds that had existed before. Uh, so uh, I I just found it a very dramatic thing and and very main like uh, for so many different reasons. One of which, of course, the changeability of of the uh, landscape there and the, and the weather. Um, anyway, I ended up doing this. Uh, at a, at a uh, size of 54 by 36. And that, uh, actually the reason I chose that peculiar size is because of another participant in the Zoom talk. Uh, a my friend Alan Friedman gave me these beautiful, this beautiful frame and th this would fit into this painting. So there it sits with this marvelous uh, frame. Whatever you think of the painting, <laughs> I can tell you that the, that the frame is terrific. And uh, so there it is. And, and I, uh, um, I haven't seen it for over a year, but I, I still stand by this picture. But let's move on. Uh, ah, more fog, more excitement. Um, this one is from a, a, a 
Well, there's a lot of uh, artistic license here, but it's in Maguntukuk uh, Lake. And uh, there I made a lot of changes. And uh, really, it was a study in grays and the gradations of gray. And there's a lot of blue in that gray. And it was, it was dawn. And the sun is back there somewhere. It's uh, informing the clouds behind, but the clouds that you can see mostly are uh, just sheets of gray and then there's fog on the water. And uh, it was a wonderfully quiet and remote feeling in there. It was, uh, it was early in the morning, it was below seven, it might have been six. And uh, uh, it was just something that I wanted to do. I, I had, uh, uh, was, had been interested in these shades of gray anyway, and this seemed like a perfect opportunity to. Uh, this, what they really are here is purple in the sky, and then the orange kind of <clears throat> it lights it all up. Uh, sometimes a contrasting color will give you a lot more juice, a lot more excitement if you have uh, you, you, if you have a contrasting color, which is the red, uh, versus all those grays, blues, purples, and then even the greens have a fair amount of gray in them. But that's <clears throat> that for me to know and you to enjoy if you uh, enjoy it. Uh, shall we move on? Yeah. So it's next one to study. Uh, yes, this is a study of something that I have uh, enjoyed and observed for a number of years. I guess uh, I've been looking at the blueberry barrens in Maine for a long time, and I've, I've painted the blueberry barrens, oh, I guess I started about a dozen years ago, <clears throat> maybe longer. The first time I did them, well, let's begin with the expression blueberry barrens. Uh, they're, as you can see, they're full of rocks, and I guess that's why people use them to farm blueberries. And blueberries have a, uh, they're very low to the ground, brushy thing, bushy things. And um, the first time I saw them, uh, it was uh, in October or probably mid to late October, <clears throat> and that bush turns red, a very dramatic red. Um, however, that was my first one, and then I've done two or three others in different uh, late colors and uh, uh, parts of the summer and of the day. And one day, I think this was two or three summers ago, I got my, my favorite one is the one in Sedgwick, or just outside of Sedgwick on the Penobscot Peninsula. and. Uh, Yes, well, that was the next one I did. Um, let's go back to that first one for a minute. Um, the purpose of the sketch was really just to uh, make a close observation of uh, how these colors, how these greens really work and how, do, how does the blueberry bush look versus the way the uh, trees on the other side of that field looks. And then there's another thing that one needs to know, and that is there are levels or shades of uh, green which uh, are uh, defined by how they are, how distant they are from your eyes. And uh, the, of course, these shades of green vary uh, according to the ambient light or how much water is in the light. And actually in this case you can pretty well see that there's a lot of purple in the in the uh, uh, clouds and that means there's a lot of water in the cloud in, in, and, a, and a lot of water in the in the uh, air. So that's what informs the the greens and uh, it's not that I'm there to make a, now let's go on to the next piece. There we go. So <clears throat> this is a 20 by 30. The small, the sketch was uh, 12 by 12. And now I've moved, I've gone to the right, because I, I, you can only do so much 
uh, when you're it, in in the at the site, and you you've only got so much time, and things are going to change quickly. So uh, you take what you can, and now I've got this big. I've got that sketch from life, and I've got and now I've got a twenty by thirty inch canvas, and again I want to make make uh, the best out of the subject that I have. And uh, how to describe this? You're, you want to make it relatively true to life, but you also want to make it in some, some way better. And one of the ways that I saw to, saw to make it better was <clears throat> to show more of the sky, because that was part of the feeling. The feeling was enormity, but it was also uh, well, there was vastness, there was also uh, wildness. These rocks are crazy. And uh, how they got there, it's like some giant had sprinkled uh, pepper, <laughs> flakes of pepper onto the landscape. And uh, there's a great randomness to it and makes it fun. Uh, I might add that these are blueberry barons and most of them have uh, rocky trails through them because the uh, people who are harvesting them when when the moment comes they have to get closer to the place and um, pull the berries off and so forth so that hence these these attractive uh, uh, rocky rocky uh, roads which I think are quite fun those are they have a kind of randomness too and there's a rawness about it and uh, and then this one rather picturesquely has water right it goes right down to the uh, to a, a small inlet to into the ocean and someone uh, on the other you know at the other end of the ridge uh, is making an attempt at farming which is uh, still done <laughs> less than it used to be but it's still done and, and that's rather picturesque too when this was done I was reasonably satisfied but I didn't think I'd given the subject quite enough uh, expanse. So let's go to the next one, which uh, is a longer Where is this, where is this blueberry barren, Joe? It's in Sedgwick. Uh, I, I know it's in Sedgwick because you, I always pass uh, a sign saying so. Um, I always get those, no, those road numbers mixed up. But Sedgwick, as you know, is uh, on uh, the Penobscot Peninsula. And this one shows the full expanse of everything. I think I took uh, artistic license and made that little island on the right side. Um, and I made the horizon a little bluer than it really is. But uh, one is, after all, making a painting and we're also making a composition or a, an orchestration of colors. And uh, that's kind of how I see it. With this painting, I'm pretty satisfied of this, about this subject. <clears throat> I could definitely see doing it um, again, but I'd probably start on this long, long scale. Uh, as I look at it, I'm rather pleased with the ge geometry of it, especially that sharp uh, angular road and it takes you right off to the right but then there's a uh, a movement coming from left to the right which is the uh, uh, furrows of, of landscape and uh, the roadway has a way of uh, fighting that uh, the geometry of the furrows of, of landscape and Altogether, I've, I'm reasonably satisfied with it. And uh, um, I put less uh, clouds in uh, for no reason except that they would, too many more clouds would just uh, confuse the issue. Because the real issue is, of course, the horizontality of the whole thing. I also included a, another little spot of blue in the, um, uh, in the water and that brings you a progress of blue to blue to blue that is the the water from coming from the right the water in the middle which is also water and then the horizon and then it takes you up to the top um, none of this is really conscious it's not I, I it sounds like I know that I'm doing this on purpose I 
only know that it's a good thing to see or not a good thing to see as I'm painting this. Because by this point now, <clears throat> it's about a year and a half after the fact of been being in that landscape on a hot uh, August afternoon. And now I'm in the winter in my studio and I'm, I'm doing this and I have to make it feel good. And I also want to, it's always been my goal, particularly in landscape, to make a painting make you feel the way I felt when I was there. I want you to feel the feeling of being there. And that includes a little now on the screen, I'm not feeling the heat, but it was a, it was a hot situation. And uh, uh, the screen will probably never give you that. But <clears throat> anyway, I did what I could to give you that feeling. I, I thought, I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm pretty well satisfied with this one. And again, you can see yeah, I made- it's, it's a beautiful painting, Joe. And actually in the horizon there, it does look pretty steamy the way the, I don't know, the steamy. fog or the mist. Yeah, it looks steamy. <laughs> I, of course, I made an effort, maybe even more of an effort in this one, to show the distance, the, the grayer distance of the far, the farther spit of land versus the nearer trees on that, on that uh, field. Uh, let's uh, move on. So, so, Joe, you're pretty well known for a variety of subjects, including landscapes, interiors, still alive, and flowers. Um, and these paintings that we're gonna be looking at now that are in the show are a lot of interiors. Um, and you're also known for your, your um, still lives of you know, tin yes. cups and objects and things like that, which we don't have in, in the show this year, but we have had in the past are quite interesting. But um, the, these paintings that are coming up were, part of an opportunity you had last summer to be out on um, an island. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, first, I want to say a thing about, about the variety of subjects. And uh, when I, uh, you know, my father was a painter and he also did a variety of things, not seldom landscapes, but often uh, interiors and often figure pa paintings. And, uh, when I started painting, I, what happened was I just got consumed by the whole thing. I, I thought he was, I thought he was nuts. I, I didn't know, have any clue why he was doing this. But then one day I had this epiphany and I started to look at paintings a little more closely. And then we moved to Paris for a year and I had, there was some time off before I went to a, a school and a, a part of the Sorbonne, a course available to students. And um, so I was often at the Louvre and all of the other wonderful museums that, that are there. And uh, I really got in, excited by some of the artists like Bonnard and Matisse particularly. <clears throat> it was the colors that I liked, uh, but also the variety. And um, it seemed to me that uh, what a real artist does is have a some kind of a Scott style, which is should be his personal mark, and that it should um, be available for use on any subject that interests you. Uh, I've noticed when I got a little older that, especially in the, in this world, if an artist makes uh, has a successful painting, he'll just do it a thousand times more. This is probably not the instinct of the artist who is successful for that one painting. He would probably like to try different things. Uh, but um, for me, it's just been second nature and I've, I've uh, uh, just always done these different things. Um, I remember showing a group of my recent paintings to another artist who was a little older and a little snarkier, and he said, oh, having a group show, are you? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> uh, but I, I hope that over the years I've become um, recognizable enough 
for the very fact of doing many things and also doing them in, in, in somehow the same way um, <clears throat> that I can, I think I can get away with it. Now, uh, so here you, here we've left the world of uh, landscape and we're doing interiors. Interiors are a great thing to do when it's rainy or freezing or any other kind of difficulty uh, involving being outside. And uh, I, I only wish that I saw more interiors that are as intriguing as, as this one. Uh, this one uh, was done in the house of Fairfield Porter, his uh, summer house in uh, an island on, uh, on the Penobscot Bay. And there's this kind of residency program that is possible if you, upon application and acceptance and so forth. And uh, I'm a big fan of Fairfield Porter. And um, I, I, one could talk about him, I wish we were talking about him instead of myself. But um, anyway, I got there and this was the very first painting I did. It was a real workathon. I, it, was, it was seven days and I was, of course, my goal to paint as many things uh, as I possibly could during that week. And uh, this was the first thing I did. I was just in awe of that red, red uh, uh, floor. I couldn't believe it. <clears throat> and the, this peculiar and distinctive yellow that the, the, the building was done by uh, Porter's father, who was both a, an architect and also something of a real estate guy. But this was his own summer house. And, and I think it's a masterpiece of a house. And uh, it's also the subject of many for Porter paintings. So for all those reasons, and I've, I've always had a thing about going to a painting to a place where someone else had painted it, partly because of the history of it. And uh, this, is, this is Fairfield Porter's place. He's got these enormous, uh, wonderful, heavy uh, white doors there on either side on the just opposite the one you can see. There's an, a very, the exact same doors on the other side. And on either and on the other sides of both doors is yet another big fat porch, and it's uh, it's a delicious place to paint. You can paint inside, of course, because you're uh, un under a porch. But this was my first thing, and uh, um, and I <clears throat> did that. And the next picture that we're going to see is an elaboration of this painting. Uh, the next one is uh, bigger, and uh, this one is 18 by 14. The next one is 24, 20, by, 20 inches by 24 inches. Let's move on. So, to the so Joe, this one we're looking at white door. Um, you said you painted it there. In yes, yes, I did it right there. Yes. You did and, it right there. Um, which, you know, as always, it's, it's a great way to you can take photos all day long, but you'll never get the same stuff because the <clears throat> a a camera is a machine. It makes its own uh, decisions and choices about what to accentuate. Uh, you come back with a camera full of bad information and uh, there's nothing like <clears throat> having the real thing. And uh, uh, so that's that's why I did this and, and then I did the next one knowing I, I knew this one knowing that I'd be doing another one then that's the next one which is roughly the same information <clears throat> but I put more on the right side and a little bit more on the left side and the of course the chair at the lower left uh, that could come and go but uh, it seemed like a very good foil or way into the into the uh, room and of course I wanted to show the uh, enormous the enormity of this uh, room it's it's more than double height it's um, uh, it's just got a great feeling about it and um, the view that I put through the window through the door is actually not it's really on the other side of the of the building uh, that is if I were looking uh, at the front of this door, I'd be seeing uh, on on my left the uh, the ocean, and uh, what you what you see in reality is actually woods and trees. But who cares? Who's claim, who's who's worrying about that? 
um, and putting the blue in the ocean, <clears throat> it allowed me to put the full range of colors. It, it's uh, the primary colors are blue, yellow, and red. And there they all are. And uh, uh, I was uh, satisfied enough with that. And uh, the, cha the stairs, which of course are one of the more complicated parts of the, of the painting, <clears throat> bring you up to a second floor. And there, there are uh, four bedrooms. And on, on the back side, same situation, a nice um, wooden stair and eight more, more um, uh, rooms, uh, bedrooms, little rooms. But uh, anyway, uh, another part of this was the, uh, to me, rather historic nature of the thing, because th these are, this is the place where Porter did a, a lot of his great paintings and uh, many of his paintings are also uh, figure paintings, <clears throat> pic pictures, paintings of his, uh, portraits of his friends and family, and, uh, and they're usually done in the, uh, in the porches. Let's go to the next one and see what, what porch that is. Oh yes, this, uh, this is the uh, side that, this is where the morning uh, can be seen. I made quite a change here. Uh, <clears throat> they have don't they don't have a blue uh, floor, um, but I made one. What they do have is a, a concrete floor, and it just didn't have any color, and it didn't have any. There was no joy in in concrete, so I did this. I was familiar with a blue floor. I grew up with one in in Rhode Island, and uh, it seemed like a reasonable enough thing to do to make it blue and it, it certainly activates all of the color. Yeah, I'm um, and this was begun in the morning <clears throat> and the uh, light coming from the upper left um, was quite intense and uh, uh, to the point where all of the verticals, the, which are the structure of the porch, um, begin to begin to break down and, and turn to uh, things you can't see. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to reproduce that feeling um, by <clears throat> dragging paint across the, uh, the uh, structure. Hang on one second. Jane, is there anything I could drink? Oh, yeah. Like water or something? Um, what, you probably all know that when you oppose a, a dark thing against the, the light, it gets darker and darker. Whereas if there is no sunlight, the blue, the white uh, structure of the porch would be, look white or at least gray, but it gets more intense as, uh, as the light changes. So, uh, so there, there again, you see that. And you can you know, I was pretty careful about doing the, the, um, uh, kind of uh, furniture they have. And uh, this is all the same furniture that, ap that appears in the Porter paintings. So um, so they, there you have it. I, I just love porches. I think, I guess I started painting porches when I was a kid or, you know, in my teens. And um, so I have a, a big fascination with porches and, and, uh, and here's one of, here's one that really gripped me, so. Let's try the next. Do you typically do that, Joe? And take a lot of artistic license, like with the floor and well, landscapes uh, too. As needed, I, uh, yeah. Sort of as needed. I have to admit that I'm usually attracted by something because it looks so good. So why would I change it? But uh, sometimes it seems like a good idea, and um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm usually not attracted by something that I have to remake and re reconceive. So um, artistic license is, is, you know, there in my uh, back pocket. I can do it as, as, as it seems like a good idea. But um, for the most part, I thought the place was, uh, was quite special. I might add, I used blue because it was going to harmonize or resonate with all of those other shades of, of blue and gray, which uh, are the... Uh, islands that you see in the, in the distance. So um, I could have done pink, I could have done yellow, but 
obviously that there was a resonance between this is like composing or harmonizing things and um I, could oh, even, I think it works beautifully. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Of course, I made up the uh, the flower arrangement um, simply because <clears throat> the red would kind of activate everything else. It would make uh, make a statement, and I, I am on a screen anyway. I'm finding myself focusing on it. Um, um, speaking of red, Joe. There's a lot of red in this show, which is which is quite beautiful. But in this next painting, um, called the Red Bucket, oh. <laughs> yeah, it, you have an interesting uh, story about bucket. how <laughs> how you got to paint the Red Bucket. Well, I'd been I'd been in Maine for a couple of days before getting to this uh, to this island, and um, you don't see a lot of red in in nature in Maine most of the time, except of course if, when it's blueberry time, <laughs> blueberry barren time in, in October, but uh, in midsummer it's a very green place. And um, and of course I, I, I went outside, there were lots of things to see, <clears throat> and including places made famous in Fairfield Porter painting. So I went out there and looked and I thought, oh my God, it's so green. And uh, then I happened upon this red bucket and I discovered that I was really longing for something red. And, it, and uh, so that was it. And, you know, there's an old cliche in the art world and in the art trade about just one spot of red, even if it's not there, I make, someone has to put it there and it will make the thing uh, sing. So <clears throat> in this case, I, uh, I tested the theory and, and God, imagine if I didn't have that red thing, it would just be, it's a red bucket stuck on a, it's actually on, on the re if it seems high, it's because it's sitting on top of a well. And I suppose it's there to keep the farmer from driving across it, through it or something. So uh, the topography around that there in the Penobscot Peninsula or Bay is, it's just fantastic. It's full of little islands, big islands, uh, all kinds of things. And <clears throat> similarly, the water is sometimes is 10 feet deep and sometimes it's 100 feet deep. Um, I guess this is why uh, sailors enjoy it because it's a challenge. Anyway, uh, that's that. That painting is only 12 by 12. I started it, I guess I knew I was going to do it. And uh, I got there about eight o'clock and <clears throat> was mostly done with the painting by uh, by lunchtime. Had, even if I hadn't, even if I'd stayed there till four, of course, then the light would change and it would be a completely different painting. Things did change even as I was there. Um, but the fun of it was <clears throat> uh, organizing all of those different greens or I don't know how many different types of green are there. Uh, it's a good thing if you can uh, keep the number of green pigments down to a dull roar, but this took just about every one I had. Anyway, let's let's get on to the next one. Uh, <clears throat> this is an interior. Why did I do this? Well, <laughs> um, I don't know if it was if it was um, uh, an overcast day when I began, but. Well, there, certainly there was the wind because I, uh, that's what gave me the idea when I, even as I started, it was windy. And uh, um, I made it into a slightly <clears throat> happier kind of day on the outside, but in the inside it was blustery and cold. Now I'm beginning to remember. Um, the same red is upstairs as it, as it is downstairs. And uh, uh, the the place the place had so much charm. I just couldn't resist. It, the I had a house a similar room like this, but um, this one was even better. It was bigger, <clears throat> as you can see. There are two beds in this one, and uh, I later found out that this was actually Porter's bedroom. So that was that made it fun, and uh, really I you know I I began to get kind of uh, excited about the 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 gusty, uh, windblown 
uh, curtain. This is not, it's not like I'm the first one to do that. Uh, it's been done before and it's been famously done by Andrew Wyeth. Uh, I, and Wyeth is an artist I like, but I don't really look at that often, but I always enjoy them, I respect them. But, um, but I couldn't fail to notice that when I was doing this, I was doing something that he had done. <clears throat> and it was so, as you can see, I'm very uh, interested in the, in the paintings of the past. I, I'm not a person who thinks that it's a good idea to just dismiss the whole five, 400 years of painting history in favor of, the, of novelty. Uh, I think that when uh, artists decided to um, abandon the past ar around 1900, uh, they left a lot of good stuff on the table. <clears throat> and I'm trying to prove that, I, that, that's, that that's a correct uh, presumption. Um, who knows? Who knows how that will work out? <laughs> but, but I'm here now. So this is all the <laughs> And uh, anyway, um, I, I made some changes. I, might, I, I changed some of the colors on the furniture there. This is just a sketch. Uh, this painting is something that you see in the front of the house there at the, in Great Spruce Head, and the purpose of this painting was just to make certain with my own eyes how the colors of Maine <clears throat> can be described in paint. And um, I learned a few things about what colors you need to put together to uh, develop <clears throat> the distance and particularly the second, the first and second of the rows of, uh, of uh, islands that are there. There's a lot of, believe it or not, there's a lot of red <clears throat> mixed into the green. Um, it gets less intense in the middle part and then fully uh, blue in the distance. But uh, there's also a certain amount of red in the, uh, in the water, which was surprising. Uh, of course, I'd noticed this before, but I'm always amazed that it, what is what is red doing in this water? But anyway, it is how it is because I suppose because of the amount of red that is in the uh, sky, the water is a reflection of what's in the sky, and uh, that's why it's kind of <clears throat> greenish when it's overcast or grayish. You can also see the red in the horizon line uh, in the clouds. That, the, dis the uh, mist over the landscape is full of red as well. And then they have, uh, this is a small painting, but, but it was fun to do, the, the geometry was fun. And uh, uh, there's a kind of small drama in, in the blue turns down to a, a small uh, point down to the lower right and suddenly you see that there is a uh, uh, a little bit of a rocky shore down there. And uh, again, I must say that's that's another piece of artistic uh, license. <clears throat> uh, what really happens is more of that scrub that is behind the tr rocks. But uh, you know, here I'm composing this thing, so there aren't really any rules, and I can do what seems like the best idea. So that, this well, it looks is, like a good idea. Uh, Joe, I just want to remind you, it's about 10 of 6, so uh, do you honestly. want to move on to the next slide? Yes, I do. Okay, and this is a, a scene from a similar vantage point. This is point. the same place, actually. Uh, this is a big picture. Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, very near. I mean, it's, it's the same place, and uh, except I left off that <clears throat> that little triangle of blue, because here the point of the whole painting was the reflection on the uh, rising sun, and uh, of course the here the the drama is the sun, and the reflection on the water, and uh, I found the silhouettes of the trees just lovely. Um, Big painting, it's about 45, 44 by 30 or something, 32. 44 by 32, yeah. 
and uh, so this is of course is not something you do by do on on site but it is something you uh, have to kind of learn to to work out as you go um <clears throat> let's go on to the next oh this was a, a tiny little picture uh that is in the same house and it's uh they have a wooden a wood stove and everything is done rather uh old-fashioned uh they there is there is electricity in the house but there is no um uh, uh, there's not not a gas furnace or anything like that it's summer house only and uh i you know was just charmed by that by the stove and um uh there was there was a number of people there so you had various there was a guy making taking ch charge of the, the food making and the um did he cook on the wood I've stove had, yeah so it was well, he cooked on a wood stove and uh, we cleaned up and uh, <laughs> that was the anyway i got there on a on a afternoon when um uh when it was quiet in there so that's only a 12 by 10 inch picture. Uh, this next one is one of the porches. It's quite a lovely painting. And then there's two more porches after this when you were talking about porches before. Um, but this yeah. one is at, at the Porter House. Yes. It's a, a uh, place where a lot of Porter's portraits were done. And uh, um, it's and with the same chair and everything so I, I mean all i needed was to have the late jimmy schuyler there and uh he was a, a poet and friend of porter and uh, uh you know the afternoon light was was upon us and uh, uh of course i didn't do couldn't do this in one day but you settle on a day on a moment in the day when it's perfect and or most interesting and uh, uh as the sun goes down the uh, the sun begins to hit the uh, more and more of the porch and it changes in orientation here I like the geometry of the uh, of where of where I put it that was the biggest decision to make um, and then of course you think up some colors that you like <clears throat> for the uh, for what's on the outside which is a big which turns out to be a bigger feature than it really is in, in reality uh what's the that, next that, that little scene joe if you look at the one panel there of the screen porch where the red laundry is and that tree that tree that little scene right there just by itself really quite lovely um the tree is haunting yeah, it, it's, a, it's a, yeah it is a, a painting within the painting it's true um it's a it's a terrific tree and uh it's not totally dead, but it's been it's got some some uh, pretty pronounced um, branches, and uh, I can't remember what the reality was, but I made up the, you know, I did what I did. It was like that, something like that. So. So this next porch is is not the uh, porter so, house. No, um, uh, this 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 is actually my house here in the Catskills and uh, but it seemed appropriate for Maine because it's uh, it's uh, uh, foggy <laughs> and uh, um, it's not uncommon that it's foggy up here too <clears throat> and um, that's that's just this is a porch that I've done quite a few times in all kinds of weathers and, and scenes and, and uh, times of day and um, th this is something it seemed appropriate to put in the, into this show because it's the kind of subject that that uh, portrait porter often did too which is tabletop still lives uh, he did very uh, casual uh, everyman kind of um, situations in what he painted and i aspire to that a, a kind of everyman uh, kind of thing and the, even in the flowers that i paint i always do, I don't do fancy flowers or complicated flowers. I try to do things that any anybody, uh, such as myself, could actually garden. Meaning, I buy uh, annuals and I get nasturtiums and and simple some simple and 
homely in the better sense of the word. Um, so yes, so this is I call it socked in, without explaining, without trying to pretend that it's uh, somewhere somewhere like, I don't know, it could be anywhere in, in Maine. But it's not. It, it's here in the Catskills. Yeah. This is a house of an old friend, and uh, it's long gone. I mean, I haven't I haven't been there in years, but I did do a couple of paintings of of this scene, uh, maybe twenty years ago. And um, anyway, this uh, so this yard scene it was really done for the dappled light. I <clears throat> I really get a kick out of doing dappled light, and uh, uh, and this offered the opportunity to do it. Um, the the house is in Maine. Um, I think the tree is long gone. I think even big hunks of that house are have been changed, but um, but it gave me a good opportunity to to not only sh show dappled light, but why they're dappled, namely the the uh, trees which, and the and the uh, light that is <clears throat> bleeding through the the uh, uh, leaves. So plus, it's it, here's a kind of a orchestration of uh, of greens, and um, <clears throat> anyway, that's that's the story with that one. Okay, this next one looks like an orchestration of greens too. <laughs> uh, Maine has very distinctive um, trees and rocks, and uh, it is an orchestration of greens, but it's also a study of those rocks. There's something about those rocks that I, they just grabbed me in. And uh, uh, I did this in 2000, I don't know, maybe I've done it over, it took me two, two or three, two sessions there over two years. And uh, I've always been interested in, um, the Hudson River artists who did things outside the uh, uh, forest interiors. The forest interiors that 19th century painters did were usually uh, leafy trees. These are all uh, conifers. And, uh, uh, but I really like those rocks and I really like the, uh, the moss. And there's different kinds of moss and different kinds of lichen. It was just a question of looking at them. Uh, you know. I, like Chauncey Gardner, I, I like to, to watch. So I just sat there uh, two days the first time and then a year later and fiddling it in with it in between. But the next year I came back with the painting, went to the same place <clears throat> and did more things. And mainly in the quest in the quest for greater detail, accuracy and sense of being there. That's, that's really what that was about. Uh, if you had to quantify, I mean, I spent as much time on that as any any painting uh, in this show. So it now, looks like it's stunning, actually. A lot of, a lot uh, of the, Yeah, the next one is a, a scene that you've done before. Many times. Um, this yes. is Soamsville. There's a meadow uh, which seems to define the what's best in uh, in um, the Solmesville area, the, t the town doesn't have much much of a town, but it has this beautiful meadow. And uh, uh, I've done it a, a bunch of times. And it's, uh, this photo seems awfully red and um, ju juiced up with red, but um, when I'm lucky, I get there in uh, late June and this uh, lupins and the, uh, the lupins are just, just a great feature. And um, uh, last time I was uh, in Somesville, I made it my business to get there in, in time for that. And uh, this is a big one, or it's a 30 inch one, but I had done, there was earlier, <clears throat> uh, I did a uh, 20 inch, 20, yeah, 20 inch um, sketch. And the, uh, the other fun thing about doing this painting the subject of Solmesville is uh, showing the light along how it sort of drags across the tops of the trees as the sun is setting, and uh, and that's really the whole that's the whole drama or subject of the painting um, is where light is hitting, light is not hitting. Um, one of the more 
intriguing things is the golden light in the foreground, and then there's a strip of slightly greener stuff, and then back to the golden light. That's because there is a big tree which is uh, stopping, is occluding the uh, the uh, shadow, or occluding the light and creating a shadow. Anyway, that's 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 that one. It's it's obviously a very picturesque place. It really does have this. Um, uh, church steeple and uh, over the oh, I must say I've painted this thing since about 1995 things have changed some trees go down some of them get bigger but um, anyway it's it's always a joy to be there what's next oh this I have a sketch uh, that I still have and this is a, an elaboration of that uh, it was crazy. It was a crazy scene with <clears throat> very wild and woolly uh, um, clouds and fog coming on the right side. There was a rain shower on the left side. Um, what What is a crazy artist to do? So I um, did what I could before I was completely rained out there myself. And uh, this is a larger version of, <clears throat> of what <clears throat> I was able to see and, and get down and paint. Uh, it's a complicated landscape, and uh, and that's part of the fun of of uh, doing a thing like this. It's just so much there. So it's it's just weather. It's just a portrait of the variable weather of the place. Next case. Oh, uh, this is ten by eight. Uh, I started this as a by very tiny little oh. painting. Oops. By 18. 10 by 18. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> on the uh, back side, that's right. And on the back, there's a small sketch that I did. Uh, and I, I've just attached it to the back side of the painting. It's the, the original is like oh, 06 by 9 or something. And then I made this and I tried it uh, as a 20 by 30. And uh, it's always painful to destroy a 20 by 30 inch canvas, but <clears throat> Somehow it seems better to do it as 10 by 18. So that's what it is. I enjoy doing uh, rocks. I've done lots of rocks. Uh, my, I think my rock masterpiece was actually in, in uh, Narragansett, Rhode Island. And I got the idea of it from a wonderful and fairly obscure 19th century American artist named H Hazeltine. And uh, he did immaculate rocks, and uh, I, you know, I wanted to try and see if I could do as well as or better than. So I always do them. Uh, Maine's rocks are complicated because they are different colors, and they, of course, reflect in different ways, and uh, do different things. The, the the rocks up there seem as if they were a huge pile of jello which then someone had cleft into different sh weird shapes and uh, um, anyway it, it was fun to do and I thought reasonably worth worth recording and uh, and looking at so there it is we have uh, one more rock painting sort of more of a ledge I guess yeah that's ledge that's uh that's I always go to the top of Cadillac Mountain, no matter what happens uh, in when I when I go to Maine. And um, uh, this this like that one of, with all of the weather, with the extreme weather, uh, were both done from up on top of uh, of Cadillac. And this is Eagle Lake. It's I think practically everybody who goes up there sees it. Um, I thought. I've done these rocks up there quite a few number, quite a few times, and enjoyed it. And uh, and do and do you know you get to enjoy having some mastery over what the rock the rocks actually look like. They're far from com from me from easy or simple. They're quite complex. And uh, uh, another thing that is fun here for me is is uh, the gradations of the landscape in the distance. How it uh, has a way of uh, receding and graying out, and uh, uh, in a different uh, weather situation, you might find that they are that there is no horizon, but in this case, there is, and 
it also shows you the vast vastness and the <clears throat> enormity of the landscape, especially as seen from the top of a big mountain like that. So I just enjoy the topography of Maine. It's, there's, there's a lot of strange stuff to look at, shapes <laughs> imagine. Um, and getting toward the end here, Joe, we have some of your florals. Yeah, um, this means to me, you can get daffodils in February and March in, a, in New York. And <clears throat> that, that is always a, a joyous moment for me. And I, you know, I paint them because because spring will come when I when I can get a hold of some daffodils, and uh, it's, uh, it's you know again this is not an easy thing to, to do. They have many many furrows and crazy little nooks and crannies to do a, a group of um, daffodils. But uh, I mentioned that I do a different a, a lot of different uh, subjects. I also uh, do them around and around. I, I do the, I do some daffodils every single um, spring, uh, whether I need to or not, and I get better at it. And uh, uh, so this is just an example of that. And, uh, you know, so if you see this painting, which is eight by eight inches, <clears throat> and I guess it comprises five or six uh, daffodils, it, uh, I actually have a whole file. I've probably done about 25 daffodil paintings. Um, not because they're, not because of anything except that they're springy. <laughs> I'm so starved for color. <laughs> well, speaking of anyway, color. what's next? Color. Uh, that was, yeah. The day that I did the sketch for the Blueberry Barons, I didn't feel that I'd suffered quite enough, so I stopped uh, on the road going to the Surrey Gardens because there was still a lot of nice light <clears throat> and it had been a blue blue day as you as you have seen. And I and the thing was the business part was over. There was no one around um, to bug me or or drag take the carts away and uh so i did this it was a sketch um it it took me about 90 minutes while there and then i don't know another couple of hours later to screw around with the with the with the actual um flowers and so forth you know where you know where you're going to put them and where they are but uh to actually delineate them is another matter and it takes a little a little more time uh, again, like that Soamesville painting, the sun is going down to the right and uh, just feathering up the, the tops of the trees um, and leaving a, a slightly dramatic um, piece of, of yellow where these hydrangea trees are being sold in pots. Um, that's all I can tell you about that one. And this next one, uh, Joe, you use these frames. Can you say something about the frames that people are quite charmed by the the whole presentation? I mean, it almost looks like the cup and the plate are in a shadow box. Yeah, instead of well, just a flat two dimensional <clears throat> painting, you know, in this in this frame. There was an artist named Bob Kulik who did very charming paintings himself. And uh, his day job was, um, uh, at least at the beginning of his career, was uh, he was very interested in frames and he was making frames and then he started uh, making reproductions of old frames. And um, so at some point, either he or one of his children started making these reproductions on a mass scale. and. Um, if, on the back, he will, there is some small description of what kind of a frame this is and, and where he got the inspiration for it. And uh, uh, they're, they're basically mass produced. I think there was um, some kind of a cease and desist order and now you can't find these anymore, but occasionally uh, when I do find one, I uh, buy them and 
just and just warehouse them until I see something that is going to be suitable for this kind of of a thing. And and lilacs, you know, like like daffodils, when that season comes, I'm I'm ready ready for action. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you can't get. I don't have lilacs at this house here, so I I have to steal them from nearby, and uh, so I don't have great clumps of them, I just get small, small little um, um, cups full and, and that's, that's seemed to be suitable. This painting is only seven by five inches approximately, so. So do you I always paint awful. your flowers, always paint your flowers from life? Oh, absolutely. I would have no idea how to begin with any other way. Um, it's, that's one of the fun things, it, and there would be no fun in in studying a flower from a photograph, or uh, and I wouldn't know how to begin to do it any other way than than in in life. And in in every case, uh, doing it from life is preferable. So, yes, this is from life. And the last flowers, the pansies on a checkered cloth. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that was a production. It was the the pansies are hard, but ch checkered cloths are equally hard, and uh, I'm a lot more adept at the pansies than I am the checkered cloth. Uh, practice makes perfect, and um, uh, I guess I it was some time ago, maybe 20 years ago, I got stuck. I didn't know what to paint, you know, and then I had these pansies and started to do them, and now I do them pretty regularly. Uh, you know, I mentioned that every man thing, and that is why I didn't want to put them in some kind of pompous, um, flowery, or ornate uh, silver or porcelain jug. I just put them right into the, as you would put them into the ground. And uh, uh, when I was finished, that's undoubtedly what I did with them. So, um, that's, this is just a subject that I've done over the years and uh, gotten used to, but it's, I, I really, you know, a lot of still lifes that you see these days <clears throat> are rather pompous and I just, I, I just can't take that. I, so, so that's why it well, is. Right. Beautiful. And I, I like the plastic sleeves that they're in. It's an interesting, it's what makes it different. Uh, Joe, do you have any more anything else you want to say before we open this up to questions? Oh, I think I've said more than enough. Uh, let if okay. anyone is still awake, <laughs> they, they can ask a question. If you'd like to ask a question, um, just raise your hand. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Really appreciate it. Um, although I am not very familiar with Porter, and uh, you are, of course, and you are a very fan of it, I do recognize similarity, in particularly when you are in the sketchy, preliminary sketching phase, mm -hmm. when you are more loose as less detail. However, I found that, and I congratulate you for that, it really is wonderful, wonderful job. However, I found instead, in the interior, I found so more similarity uh, with Harper, Edward Harper, because of the color, the flatness of the color and the, and the way you treat also the sort of look like a minimalism in the, of the interior. Do you, do you see that as well? I, I, I'm flattered by any com comparison to Harper. Um, I, honestly, I, uh, I wish you were able to see these in person because uh, I like I like the flatness and the broadness of Hopper's treatment, but I do get into details that Hopper wouldn't be bothered with. And uh, I do actually make an effort to modulate uh, the colors, uh, whereas he will often make a single plane of color uh, to describe whatever it is he's describing. Um, I, think, I think you're being, um, or that the computer, screen is taking away some of the what I hope is is the richness of the coloring that I do because I do actually especially in the dark places 
uh, and like for example the that red floor and the and the white door um, I'll actually try to sneak in unexpected colors uh, in especially in the shadows where you see where you think it's going to be gray or black I might um, cheat and put in a purple a dark purple or something like that um, so I and uh, so I, but I love I, I have heard Hopper before uh, in reference to my pictures and particularly of man-made things uh, stillness is usually the uh, uh, what people say is the, is the stillness and and uh, that's that's fine with me I you know I, I think a lot of my pictures are often rather still and um, uh, and and quiet and peaceful and, and that that's fine with me if that's the, if that's the message I'm making that's 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 better than the opposite <laughs> I, think. I know it's right it's wonderful by the way it's the metaphysic composition of the interior and the color that of course you write about the fact that on the computer it doesn't give you justice so I uh, probably will have to see that in person but I really thank you very much you wonderful job congratulations thank you thank you Um, um, we have a question, another question here from Nate. Uh, that might be Nat. Nat. Yeah. yeah. Joe, can you hear me okay? I can. I can even see you. <laughs> Wonderful seeing you. I'm sorry we don't do this, but I just, I, a comment more than a question. Uh, going back to the, the Blueberry Baron series and your working uh, through of that, you you talked about starting with nature and making it better, and you talked about your interest in the sky and the rocks but i think you're keeping your 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 talent under a, a bushel here i mean the color of the water that you do i mean particularly in that painting but you, you know you, did, you haven't said very much about the actual color of the water that you do but it i found it fascinating and i i think it's equally skilled as your handling of rocks or sky so don't don't leave out the water when you're talking about uh <laughs> the things that you do well and make nature better on. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and I, I, I can say that making the uh, sky, uh, the, the, the water blue is uh, like a lot of other things is not so easy, not as easy as it sounds like or that it ought to be. So it's, it's yeah, it's not just more blue, right? Correct. It's full of other stuff, but because you modulate it, and it you know, you, get into greens, which means you're really getting into yellows and um, and even reds. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, feel free to raise your hand and... Can you hear? I can't get the, my hand to raise, but this is Lynn. Hi, how great to see you. Uh, well, you can't see me. I think you're just seeing a picture, but... No, I'm, I think I'm seeing, I'm seeing yeah. And therefore, I'm enjoying your background as well. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and so, so I've talked to you about uh, your work other times, but it was it's very interesting because one of the things that comes across is just your enjoyment, your pleasure in doing this thing that you've been doing for a long time. And, you know, how if you, it, it doesn't matter how many times you've looked at something, you're seeing something every time that's taking, you know, your concentration. So it's a kind of, it's almost, it's almost a kind of a philosophy of how to live is to be paying attention. Uh, that sounds good to me. And it is what I've been doing is just paying attention and looking. Uh, I have to say during this, this whole COVID thing, uh, everyone is constrained to the place that they're in. And we, I've been in this house. It, it looks pretty fascinating to me from a screen. <laughs> looking backwards, but man, am I bored here? <laughs> it's terrible to say it. <laughs> it's, Cause it is, cause I, you know, I know there's lots to look to paint here, but I've been looking and looking and looking at the same place now since uh, May. And uh, I'm, I'm ready for a change. Typically I would spend a few weeks in Maine. Uh, and uh, that's a trick, you know, it's a treat because everything, I've been to many parts of Maine many times but it's different because of the different days that I come and the different weather on those trips and so forth. So uh, I, I could use a change, but um, but you're right. It, it is a slightly Zen-like thing to just keep looking and looking better and looking harder. And when one does get be a little better at it, I mean, every time I 
do daffodils, for example, <clears throat> I get a little better at doing it. Uh, as a writer, it's, I mean, it's not so different. You know, you keep writing sentences <laughs> yep. and, and sitting there and, and you can get really excited about a verb, you know, so I, I think, uh, or sound, you know, in the, in the language. And I, I think that that's just in the nature of giving yourself over to something and, and becoming so used to doing it that you're, you're not really fighting it. Um, whereas I, I teach and see people who are, you know, asking themselves 8 million other questions rather than just paying attention. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot to be said for doing the thing. And, and you know, there are a lot, like this Bob Kulik, who did the lovely, beautiful paintings. Uh, he did, he was satisfied to do a small thing, but do it well. I mean, the more he did it, the better they got. Uh, but it was a very, it was a small ambition, but he, but he did it so nicely that, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't argue with the final product that he, that he made. So. Uh, Joe, we have another question here. I'm not sure, uh, just says I. Did oh, you it's hi, Irene. ask your question? Oh, hi, Irene. Hi, Joe. Hi, how are you? Um, I actually just have a comment that uh, has um, people have come into the gallery over the last um, week or so and commented on how much they like the variety of your framing. Yeah, well, I like uh, old frames too. And, um, you know, I used to just do a kind of house frame and uh, then uh, various forces caused me to get float frames and get more into the 21st century. And I'd done all that. And so now I'm being told that the green, that the gold ones are back, back in business. And that's good news. After all, they were adequate for four or 500 years. What, what would be so wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just, the two various kinds of frames I used, including that wonderful one that my friend gave me. Um, and uh, that's, yeah, there's a variety. Uh, it, you know, obviously, the, I, I, I have a, a small inventory of old frames. They, they stay around with me for sometimes 15 or 20 years because it takes a while to find the right uh, painting to put in the frame or vice versa. So uh, that's the problem with keeping a variety of frames as you keep them for a long time. Um, but sometimes I know a pa I get a, do a painting and know exactly which framer I'm going to use. I, I've got three different framers that I use. Uh, I'm glad that people are reasonably okay with the frames. Uh, Joe, it's Peter Fairbanks. How many, <clears throat> I wondered how many people were at the Fairfield Porter House when you were there and um, were yeah. they a problem? <laughs> Not, no, they were a pleasure. There were, uh, I think there were eight. And um, there was a, a, a cook and his consort, his sous chef. And um, two or three of them were very good. And one or two were rank amateurs. And I had a, an, a well, I, to me, I thought it was quite funny. Uh, the first painting I did with the white door was uh, in the house, and I, I brought the usual stuff that I bring, which is uh, uh, turpentine and um, paint thinner, and I was painting away. That painting took about two and a half days, and sometime during the second, uh, the second day, um, the, the niece of Porter, who was in charge of everything, uh, came and related a... a uh, problem that was being had and I was the cause of it the one of the most amateurish person there <clears throat> was unable to cope with the lint with the smells of linseed oil and turpentine and paint thinner and did not have anything else and it you know I was as I was baffled and surprised that a person would uh, go to a paintathon and be uh, unable to tolerate the smell of paint and the, and the attendant uh, smells. But um, fortunately, um, Anina did say there was a, a solution and she had it at hand. There's some kind of a glop that you can put, uh, I think it's canola oil actually, will also clean, clean paint. 
And uh, so I took that suggestion and did it. Of course, <clears throat> as soon as that the uh, complaining person pushed off, I went back to the turpentine, which works a lot better. But anyway, I, I was just amused that someone would get into a paintathon, but uh, objects to the smell of paint. <laughs> so, Anyway, yes, that that was. But anyway, it was a, it was a quite a variety of people, and it was and it was a lot of fun. Do we have any other questions? If we're close to the end, this is yes. Bob Larson. Can we okay. uh, can we turn our video on and go into gallery mode, and I'll wave to Joe. Yes, everybody <laughs> can. I'm waving to you. Mute yourself. <laughs> you look great. It's great to see you all. Great to see you. I would have one question. Your video. It's uh, you have a question here. Uh, David, Nathan, David Nathans, um, you, you had mentioned Hazeltine as one of uh, the people you admired, 19th century painters. Can you suggest one or two others, uh, 19th century uh, painters that, that you also admire for maybe well, their trees or landscape? Yeah. Yeah, there are different artists that I like for different things. You know, I like Porter for his slop, sloppy and fearless uh, and sometimes clunky, um, but endearing paint handling. Uh, Hazeltine, on the other hand, is quite neat and precise. I've been to many of the places that he actually painted and he makes a lot of changes and does things, uh, but his, his uh, a lot of precision and charm in, in his way of doing things. Uh, for me, at an early stage, Kenzie was a huge deal, and to, and even to this minute, uh, Sanford Gifford is is God, and he has been handling just to die for. Now I have learned one thing about uh, Gifford: many of his most delightful paintings are very small, and it is not necessarily possible to do a, a Gifford-like paint handling on a big scale. Uh, although uh, it has been done, but, um, but for the most part, his uh, paint handling, which is delicious, is all, is all on a small scale. Okay. Um, who else do I like? Well, there's just so many good artists and good things to like. I mean, Hopper, it's not so much about the paint handling, but about the mood. And um, so, you know, it's, it's a world of wonderful paintings, if you like paintings. <laughs> and, uh, Thanks. Thank you. For your landscape painting, you know, everybody can see the clear influence of the Hudson River School there. But what about some of your interiors and your still lives? Who were the painters that you most admired um, that, you know, gave you that signature style? Well, the interiors, interiors are rather like a, a still life in the sense that everything involved is, is uh, stay uh, stationary and not that much subject to light changes. Um, for me, the guy that really gave me um, the green light on the on interiors was a dear friend named George Stave, um, who, uh, he died about seven or eight years ago. He was in his 80s. Yeah. And uh, we used to paint and uh, the intensity and the uh, drivenness with, the, with which he worked, even in his 80s, uh, was really just remarkable and inspiring. And he did brilliant uh, interiors. And, uh, uh, and he did also great um, still lifes. George Stave, you'll never find anything about him. You can, you can Google him and you can find there a website devoted to his work. Um, uh, but he's, he, he had very little success. Uh, the galleries weren't interested, but if you Google this guy, you're, you're gonna, he'll blow you away. Um, and he, he was uh, just a, a great influence on me. For, and as for the still lifes, uh, <clears throat> I just, uh, I got into the tipsy cup paintings, which is all those enormous, those, those enamel cups and so forth. And, um, but I do a lot of other still lifes. I really enjoy them because they do stay where they are and uh, you can really study them and enjoy everything about them and, the, and enjoy the, the doing of the painting. And um, uh, he, he also did good still lifes, great still lifes, and he always called them, he always thought of Morandi as, as his influence. 
Uh, he, yeah, but he was he was actually, uh, I think, quite different from Morandi. But he he anyway, um, he was much more colorful than Morandi. But uh, but I have learned over the years that still lifts really need a kind of a little something more than just a vase full of flowers that is so done it is so over that it's sort of not worth doing unless you've got something that is different about them and uh uh so that that's i'm going to show you on this page. well I, I was just going to say we've got a nice selection right behind you yeah. here's, um here's, oh can you yeah here yeah. i did this one because really i did it be, it's a so a silver something or other uh, creamer, but the reason I did it was because of this hunk of this little loop of uh, nasturtium yeah, vine. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, and it just and that uh, it disrupted the blue vase and allowed me to do the red, the yellow, the blue all together without too much blue. I don't know. I mean everything. You want it to, to look real and natural, but also to be interesting and intriguing. So that was your the, colors are so much stronger, and um, you know they remind me more of like 15th century, um, you know, early Renaissance paintings. You know, with that super lush, rich, deep tones, which you don't necessarily employ in your landscapes. Uh, to the same effect. It's like your color scheme really does shift kind of dramatically between subjects, which I think is always kind of interesting to see. Well, landscape is uh, between me and the thing that is being landscaped or painted. There's a great deal of atmosphere between my eye and it. So there's always a lot of, of air and you want to paint the air. That was I like about Gifford is you're painting that painting air and and actually molecules of water that you can't see. Right, right. So that's why it's a little more on the muted side. Yeah. The yeah. fabrics and cloths you've been using in your still lifes are amazingly complementary too. Well, the that, geometric patterns and the colors com contrasted with the flowers and the things I think is fabulous. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, one can get in the trouble with background colors, and uh, it's it's a great practice to settle up, settle on the background first. But many many times I've found that I'm not satisfied with the background, and I spend as more as much time doing the background as I do the actual subject. But that's just one of those problems. <laughs> one, it's not fun if there aren't, aren't problems. So it's like a puzzle. It's like making a puzzle. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I guess I would like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And I'd like to thank Joe for, you know, putting on such a wonderful show or painting such a wonderful show. So I'd just like to thank everybody for joining us and Joe especially. Good night, Joe. And Good night. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Well. Wonderful talk, Joe. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good to see you all. Bye. See you all again. <laughs> Bye.